brilliant John Culshaw. Absolutely brilliant. As we say, why? Why have one guest when you can have a hundred and one? Yeah, well, I, I want to, I just want to have one opportunity. The game's not kicked off yet, but it will. St Johnson need a right good run of goals. We're playing Aberdeen at home in Perth today, so I want to imagine the teleprinter, St Johnson 3, Aberdeen 0, but I want it read to me by Tony Blair. <laughs> <laughs> right? OK, well, you know, as I did so often, you know, what was the result you wanted? I wanted <laughs> Aberdeen, St Johnson 3, Aberdeen 0. No. St Johnson 3, Aberdeen 0, no, you know. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> no, listen, bad, hey, <laughs> we'll stick with that. For the listeners at home, 80295 in the text, you can email off the ball at bbc.co.uk or the dear people in here if you put your hand up again because, of course, sadly, the classified results... Are, are no, no more. more. Radio yeah. 5 Live have stopped them. Oh. So we'll kind of bring them back for one day only. Tell us what you're, depending on who you support, a dream result and someone that you would like it read out in the style of. For example, again, the audience would be disappointed if we didn't mention the cup final, May the 18th, 1991, right? <laughs> and uh, my team won it, John, 4 3. Motherwell 4. Uh, they've, they've only won it. Motherwell 4. <laughs> <laughs> Motherwell 4, Dundee United 3. Could I have that, please, in the style of Dale Winton? <laughs> Motherwell 3, Dundee... <laughs> no, let me get the result right. I've got to write it down. What were the numbers again? It was 4-3 to Motherwell against <laughs> Dundee United. Motherwell 5, Dundee United 0. <laughs> Brilliant! <laughs> Course, right, um, get them in, get them in. John, we had you on, um, uh, it was a, a couple of months ago, a few months ago now, we were desperate to get you back when the festival started because, and here's the plug, because you're still, you've got another good week of doing your uh, Les Dawson show. Yeah, tell us about it. Yes, that's right, sir. Les Dawson flying high, a chance to uh, operate my voice around about here. I'd love to hear Les Dawson doing the football results. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Alder shot three, Billy the Kid shot 209. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now, John, just, just uh, staying for a moment with um, Les Dawson, what, what attracted you to him as a character? Because it's more than just simply putting on a voice, isn't it? Oh, yeah, the, his love of words, his creating word pictures in his comedy. That wonderful, lugubrious use of language. Ah, right. Where each joke would be just a mosaic piece of the story. And then, at the end, a great hobnail punchline would come in. And yeah. the punchline would <laughs> hit you like a pie in the face. <laughs> and also, you know, his philosophy and his musicality and just everything about him. Really. Did you grow up loving him when you were on the telly and that? Yeah? Oh, yes, exactly. I, I remember uh, seeing um, his Opportunity Knox recording where he first... First came through, and uh, yes, he simply walked on there. Yes, thank you very much indeed. Good evening, Fun Hunters. I never expected to hear such enthusiastic applause when my name was announced. I wasn't far <laughs> wrong either. <laughs> John, let me take you right back because uh, you're synonymous, of course. There'll be fans of Dead Ringers in, um, which is an absolutely brilliant show, and one of our kindred spirits and off the ball, uh, Lewis McLeod, oh, yes. who's been involved in this show since uh, day one. When you were starting out, and this might give your age away even, who were the voices that you first did? Oh, well, I started out, um, I think, in the in the early 90s. That was when I was trying to come through. And the voices at the time, it's a wonderful snapshot of that period. Uh, let me see, Frank Bruno was very much there, you know. Frank Bruno. <laughs> you know, this was the time when he was in there with Tyson and Mark Tyson coming on to you like a harbour shark, you know. But I've got the power, I'm going to stop him, you know what I mean? I'm going <laughs> to... <laughs> see if you were lying doing that, it'd be just like him. That'd uh, be brilliant, yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, and what other ones at the time? Oh, the, um, I, the, the 90s boxers. This was a wonderful era yeah. of, of yeah. characters in boxers. And of course, meet Mr. Eubank and this great rivalry. I'm, I'm a very sensitive soul, you know, but the boxer always beats the fighter. So those of you who bet on Nigel, that was a bad bet because the boxer always beats the fighter. No, listen, listen, I'm just going to go out there and then Ben would come firing back in. Listen, I've got the power, I've got the body movement to totally, you know, <laughs> totally outfox Chris Eubank. So listen, oh, he will know, he will know on that night, you know. <laughs> uh, John, I have to ask you this. Brilliant. Yeah. Superb. But, uh, John, I have to ask you this, and it's probably the toughest one to reflect on an answer. 
Is there a character from popular culture, popular life over the last 20 years that simply evaded you, where you can't quite nail the voice and it's been something that frustrates you because you really want, it's a popular character, you want to be able to put it in your act, but there's something about it that doesn't quite ring true? I think it was probably um, David Cameron, uh, yeah. the former Prime Minister, because he's a bit boring and a bit anodyne and there's nothing really there. Mm. He's sort of, I would always, in the voice of Alan Bennett, describe him as rather like a... <laughs> A wax, a wax candle you'd get from a gift shop. Yeah. You know, um, so there was just sort of nothing. You know, you could do the generic posh and all of that sort of thing, but... Yeah, it but was, it was just, never quite him. It was just generic posh. Yeah. And it would suck the life out of your comedy sketch. Yeah. <laughs> so ones like that, those, yeah. the, the sort of more dull ones. Now, without doing the voices, but we just want a list here, as quick as you can, machine gun fire style, for the listeners at home, the listeners in here, who've got a fantasy result in mind, but they're struggling maybe of a voice. Just give us a batter through some of them that you do, some of the personalities. Oh, let me see. Well, maybe, you know, Professor Brian Cox, who would take 20 <laughs> minutes to give a <laughs> single... <laughs> I don't know, maybe John Bishop there, he could really sort of sound it out in a very bold way. Uh, who else can we have? I think, you know, maybe bother, but props not for much longer. <laughs> I think maybe the entire result should be read by Billy. <laughs> Brilliant. Right, you've got so many to choose from. Can I just uh, ask you this? This is one time I'm surprised that you've not asked this conundrum. It's a one-man show. How does he do Sissy and Ada? Uh, oh, yes, uh, they are there. They yeah. are there. How do you do it? Uh, we did a bit of green screen filming uh, a few uh, months ago. Yeah. Uh, so, yes, uh, Ada there. Ada there, yes. Um, that was the, the real name of uh, Les's mother-in-law. Yeah. Ada Plant. And, yes, very much, yes. I never spoke to the mother-in-law for six months. I didn't like to interrupt her. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and so I filmed as, as Ada on one side with the handbag just under my chin. And then uh, Roy Barraclough's character, Sissy, just uh, on the other side. Oh, that's right, love. Oh, Ada, darling, you can be very indecorous, you know. Yeah, yeah. She, she'd put her phone voice on and she'd knit her own cardigans ever so good quality, you know. <laughs> you see, that, that is what is brilliant about John. We're not, we know we, we, we blew plenty of smoke up your backside the last time, but he's, he's absolutely brilliant. To also do the Roy Barraclough voice there as you did, is, that's just spot on. Spot on absolutely yeah. brilliant. So get your requests in. A fantasy result, John, a question that I always like asking um, any guy like yourself, certainly an impression is, has, has anyone ever taken offence or been a wee bit perturbed by your impressions? I think uh, most people tend to be more worried if they're not done. But, uh, <laughs> you hear you hear a few tales. Um, apparently, uh, we, we, we did a Michael McIntyre sketch mm. where he was sort of speaking in his way like a very cheerful Dalek. <laughs> and, and initially, he was slightly taken by surprise, so yeah. we hear. Uh, although, uh, very soon afterwards, we were both at a charity event, and he says, So you do me, so why don't you stand by me, and you do me, and I will be me, and we'll auction you doing me and raise the money for the charity. And somebody paid a thousand pounds for that time. Oh, brilliant! Well, that was rather good. Now requests are coming in ah. uh, for John, as you'd expect. The one, and it's it's one of his absolute toppers, uh, but he, he he hasn't treated us to it yet. Uh, John Thompson says, uh, "Great to hear John Culshaw on the show. Could he do the classic, the all-time classic Scottish football result, four for four, East Fife five, <laughs> as the one and only Tom Baker?" Oh, yes. Well, all the syllables are very much... Uh, oh. <laughs> East 5-4. Five, 4-5-5. Four, four, five, five. <laughs> yes. Brilliant. No. There are so many Scottish teams that sound so fantastic in the voice of Tom Baker. Stenhouse Muir. <laughs> Hamilton Academicals. They all sound fantastic as Tom. Yeah, ah, absolutely. absolutely superb. Right. Um, hi, Stuart, Tom and John. Uh, Ron Fraser. Uh, well, I'll, 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 we can only ask. It would be great to hear John read out my fantasy result. Celtic 5, Rangers 0. Using the voice of Muhammad Ali. Oh, just give me those numbers again. Uh, Celtic 5, Rangers 0. Celtic 5, Rangers 0. <laughs> Celtic fans, they are feeling ill. 
That's very good, that's very yeah. good. Joy of joys. In fact, this guy is clearly such a fan of the show, he might even be in. Uh, there was a gentleman a few weeks ago, Struan Adam, Struan Adam, uh, from West Kilbride, and uh, Struan sent us a poem called Trope on a Rope which he dedicated to off the ball, right? And I thought this was incredible. And I forgot all about it a few weeks ago. Yeah. I'm so glad it is going to get aired in front of a, 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 a live studio audience who can show their appreciation for it. Listen to this. If you're a fan of off the ball, if you even listen to a dozen shows in your life, you'll get this. So here it is, Trope on a Rope. Uh, yes, indeed. Tasty, brilliant and wow. It used to be a football show, but it's not really now. <laughs> the odd couple battle and they like to think they're like Muhammad Ali, but it's more Ingobert Humperdinck. <laughs> Steel men, Saints, cup finals and doubles. It could be worse. Sydney Divine, tiny bubbles. <laughs> Detroit, Motown, NME, Channel 4. Yes, we've heard it, uh, but you can't say it's a bore. Superstar guests, you get them for free with a plug. But when Sir Davy McMillan is on off the ball, he got a mug. If you need a mattress, Chris Boyd will sort it and eat cake. Just remember his payment is a good protein shake. <laughs> <laughs> uh, with Lionel Itchy on the mic and VD from France, Professor Leach uh, phones in, not taking a chance. But pound for pound, the advice is sage. Don't buy Vegas tickets too near the stage. This is an astonishing. Team of the week, play out with a song. A limerick from Sri Lanka. What could go wrong? Uh, the show goes in fast. The jokes come at pace. You might even do a Kirk Broadfoot and get egg on your face. A diverse range of music which Tam loves to sing. Steam's no good for the 11, but get Tommy Ring. Petty Alan Forum, the chat is like no others, and every now and then we hear their love for their mothers. I hope you like this uh, cliched rhyme, a JFK moment. Just remember the time. But I'll stop writing now. I think that's enough. Just one last thing your show is pure guff. <laughs> ah, brilliant! Absolutely. Now, uh, here's a wee bit. Uh, I'm, I'm delighted to be able to uh, read this out, you know. We've got a lot of time for our listeners. Uh, we're never done thanking them. And we get listeners all around the, uh, the world. And here's where we go for a wee bit of audience participation, believe it or not. Um, a lovely email that came in from Margaret Thompson this week. She says, Hi, Stuart and Tam. I'm writing to you from sunny Calgary, Alberta, in the hope that you could give a wee word of encouragement to my dear husband, John Thompson, who is facing an almighty fight against cancer. Um, it all came on very suddenly and in the last couple of months, sadly, tests upon tests, uh, we got the diagnosis two weeks ago uh, that it's actually spread. Um, obviously, I don't want to get into too much detail. I just wanted to say, boys, that he's an avid Aberdeen fan through thick and thin and he's very, very proud of having been in the stands at Pataudry's in the 80s watching all that marvellous action before we emigrated to Canada. He was thrilled when the radio started streaming across the world and he could listen to all the chat and hilarity on Off The Ball again. He has taken all this with amazing humour and bravery. Thanks very much, guys. Margaret Thompson. So he's a big Aberdeen fan. Better than just wishing him all the best. I would urge our studio audience here, let's have a quick wee burst of the Northern Lights just for John Thompson in Alberta in Canada. He's having a rough time, so on the count of three, one, two, three. The Northern Lights of old Aberdeen mean home, sweet home to me. The Northern Lights of Aberdeen is where I long to be. I've been a wanderer all of my life and many a sight I've seen. God speed the day when I'm on my way to my home in Aberdeen. Yeah, yeah all the best to you, John. And, and John. Uh, John, just to show that we've no gone soft, I hope he's get turned over at Perth. <laughs> 
Sean, yep. uh, walkouts. Have you ever? I mean, you. I mean, I don't know why Emdy would walk out, and you're not, shall we say, material-wise. You don't try to exactly like you're doing the Frankie Boyle, Jimmy Carr route. You wouldn't have had a walkout, surely. No, there was one occasion um, when I was doing a Donald Trump, and I did a few Donald jokes. I, I, I will visit the United Kingdom again. I'm going to visit Stratford upon Avon, birthplace of William Shatner. <laughs> <laughs> And there was this chap who just got up and went straight out. And yeah. Oh, have I offended an American fellow here? Uh, but a few minutes later, he came back in and just sort of in a gap, sort of, I needed the bathroom, I'm so sorry. <laughs> jo jo John Culshaw, one thing, uh, the story or the life story of Les Dawson, inevitably, you know, he's passed away, so does the, does the show follow his life? Is it bittersweet in that sense that you see him through to his passing? Not quite. It's, no. it's a snapshot. Yeah. It's set in December 1985, where, so the story goes, Les was booked to uh, play a private party uh, for an oil tycoon in New York right. whose wife uh, hailed from Leeds and was homesick and missed the idea of, uh, of Yorkshire puddings and, and uh, you know, things of home. And Les Dawson, the comedian that, w that was for her, so he was flown over to New York on Concord. Mm -hmm. And this is around about the time he wanted a novel of his printed. Mm -hmm. And uh, the publisher said, yes, Yes, OK, we'll print your novel, but finish your autobiography. So, yeah. so the story goes, he got a dictaphone on the flight and just pulled together some final notes for his autobiography. So we thought that's a lovely way to frame the show and a Brilliant, yeah. setting to remember his life yeah. and put yeah. it all together. Um, hello, lads, says Barry Watson. He's in Scotsdon in Glasgow. Um, I don't even have a request uh, for a fantasy football scoreline. All I want to say is that John has got to be one of the best guests that you've ever had in the 28 years of the show. I could listen to the man all day. Him doing Ricky Gervais to Ricky Gervais was absolutely brilliant. Any chance of a wee burst of that? Yeah, OK, OK, must make it clear, yeah? OK, ooh. <laughs> OK, on, on that show, yeah, OK, I had no idea, yeah, that he was going to be there. And then, <laughs> so I came in... Ricky Gervais is sat there. Oh, good opportunity, OK? He's cornered, so, yeah, do all the little squeaks. Ooh. <laughs> uh, oh. <laughs> there he was, his little face. And he was he was sort of cornered, sort of moving into the side of the wall. Uh, but he was very generous. He yeah. Said, yeah, OK, fine, yeah. Little bit more David Brent than me, but OK, I'll give you that. <laughs> I'll give you that anyway, OK? Ooh. <laughs> very good, isn't it? Huh? That, that's an interesting thought, Tam, as to whether the comedian becomes the character, and it's actually the character you're parodying yeah. rather than the comedian. Yeah. Uh, I have to say, Tam, our next guest is a gentleman who has many different things that we can talk about. Let's hear it for the multi-talented Scottish comedian, Chris Forbes. <laughs> Can I say, I, you know, I follow you on Twitter because uh, I'm easily seduced by gags in which you feature as the other Murray brother. This is Duncan Murray, who's been abandoned by his mother, Judy, <laughs> because she's got two older brothers that are tennis players. Tell us about the character and do people believe you are? Honestly, it, it's frightening how many people still believe that Duncan exists. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I believe one person actually phoned the police when they were concerned that Judy had indeed locked him in her attic. <laughs> um, uh, Any time I put something up, people really engage with them. I think that way of people think that if they're friends with the family, they've kind of got an in there. But uh, yeah. people are genuinely very concerned for him, which yeah. is kind of concerning for me, but, you know, very likeable as well. It's nice that people care so much about this black sheep of a family that doesn't yeah. even exist. I'm, I'm putting you right on the spot here, right? We've got uh, Chris as the brother. I'm hoping we've got John Culshaw as Andy Murray. Could you just have a wee chat? Yes, I think farms are very interesting. <laughs> Some of them, uh, a relative of mine once owned a mushroom farm <laughs> where he sort of like created things in the dark very quietly and I, I found great comfort there. <laughs> 
Yeah, you were always the weird one growing up, Andy. So uh, I don't know. I'm still waiting to hear if you're coming to my show. Me and Mum are doing it tomorrow, and you haven't got back to any of us. So what's going on there, Andy? Well, I thought it was just a given that I would just show up and be there. And of course, I will be very supportive. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. Yeah, brilliant. Brilliant. Uh, and, of course, uh, uh, Judy is participating in the live show with you as well, Chris, and she presumably plays herself the mother. So how, how have you composed the show? How's it written? Yeah, so we've kind of done, through the years and since uh, the first sketches came out, we've done a couple of live events where we've done kind of Q&As that Duncan has crashed that she has been doing with Jamie or Leon Smith. Yeah. And so we found that it worked quite well in a Q&A setting. Did, did Judy rush towards the idea or was she reluctant to begin with? Uh, at first she just didn't have a clue what was the going on. Was, yeah, yeah she, she was up for doing something and supporting local talent and uh, she heard that there was a sketch, but not until she turned up onto the day till she, did she really realise the concept of it. Mm. But if anything, she, she liked it too much. Yeah. She, she really enjoyed twisting the knife into Duncan and uh, <laughs> she comes up with a lot of ideas and she'll text me and be like, I think I'll walk on stage with wine, you know, because that's what Duncan's driven me to. And, yeah. you know, she's, <laughs> she's really... I think she believes he's real now and she can... <laughs> You know. Stevie Yates just says uh, that poem was amazing. Uh, that was the trope uh, poem for Off the Ball by Struan. He says, can you please get it up in Twitter, lad, so I can get a copy. Uh, what a response here. We need to thank our uh, audience here in Edinburgh for this. Uh, Kevin says, uh, well done, lads. Uh, very touching. Uh, that wee bit of community singing there. And all the very best to John in Canada. Aileen Campbell says, my goodness. Goodness. Um, off the ball has made me laugh lots over the years, but never cry. Uh, hearing the Northern Lights being sung for Mr. Thompson was really moving. Uh, what a lovely gesture. Sending positive thoughts and good wishes to the Thompsons in Canada. Glass eye moment at the Northern Lights. Uh, well done, guys, and your fabulous studio audience. Ladies um, and gentlemen, let's have a very, very warm round of applause for John Culshaw, who has to leave. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Best of luck. What a man, eh? Yeah. Unbelievable. Go and see Les Dawson. Brilliant. Thank you, John. Yeah, and before... Well, uh, the bad news. The bad news is any requests we get for impersonations yeah. now, Chris. <laughs> right. If you want to get a plug for anything you're doing, you've got to have a go at these, all, all right? right? As long as they all sound like Andy Murray. Right, <laughs> that's all right. That's yeah. all right. <laughs>